Welcome everyone to episode whatever, I can never remember the number, of the Team House. I'm Jack Murphy. This is our guest, Michael Ames. Michael is a journalist and he's the author of American Cipher, which is really a, a deep dive on Bo Bergdahl, the American soldier who walked off of his base in Afghanistan and was held captive by the Haqqani Network for how many years, Michael? Almost five. Almost five years until he was released. Um, and it... It's a super controversial event, of course, and your book was pretty controversial as well. And some of your findings and some of the research that you did with your co-author, and uh, we'll talk all about that, uh, but I think people are also wondering where my co-host is, Dave. Um, so Dave believes that he has the cold. He calls me up or he texts me and he's like, Jack, I, uh, I got a runny nose. I think it's just a cold, man. It could be just the cold, it could be just that, or it could be the boomer remover. We don't know. We just don't know. He hasn't been tested yet. Um, so, Did you learn that from your daughter? No, my like daughter's not old enough. No, maybe she is just about old enough. Um, she hasn't hit me. She hits me with other smart ass comments, but not that. <laughs> um, so yeah, Dave, Dave is out tonight. He called in sick and that's okay. Uh, I told him, you know, we can hold things down here and we'll see him again next week. He's um, doing the right thing. Yeah, probably. Um, you know, my whole thoughts on it is that, you know, it's like chicken pox, like we're all going to get it. So we might as well just get it over with, at least for, for like people my age right. that are in good health, you know, just get it over with. You know, I know for old people, it really is a concern or right. people who have compromised immune systems. It's a, it's a big deal. But I mean, this could be our last live stream uh, before we become like Radio Free Brooklyn inside the containment zone. <laughs> you know, they just have like giant steel walls, you know, like fallout uh, with like automated gun sentry turrets. There's like a fucking machine gun and anyone down who tries to escape the city. Like that, that, and here we are. We're like in here and there's going to be like a pirate flag behind me. Like, <laughs> you will not silence our voices. You know? Yeah, with the last toilet paper rations yeah, yeah, yeah. that we're selling for five hundred dollars. <laughs> Cats and dogs living together. <laughs> Did you go to a supermarket today? I went yesterday, uh, a local supermarket, and there was uh, a line. The hipsters were lined up from the door, essentially wrapping all the way around the supermarket. Um, and as others have noted, it's very interesting their purchasing selections. You know, the like. Hipsters. Yeah, yeah, like I need that, uh, what's that like, um, that, that like fancy yogurt, you know, like, like do you need like five, you go to the supermarket in a time of emergency, you get like five cups of that, I mean, <laughs> nothing against yogurt, we all love yogurt, but yeah, I mean, it'll keep your gut healthy. Yeah, it will. It was pandemonium in my local supermarket this afternoon, and it hadn't been up until today for whatever reason, but all of a sudden, it was like, it hit, it, 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 it hit. hit. The thing that surprised me the most was the meat, the meat department, just empty. Really? Shelf after shelf, empty. People just, I don't know how they're going to do it, you know? It's nice out, maybe they're just going to start grilling. It's grilling season. Could be, could be. <laughs> it is getting nicer out. Um, man, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I don't know if we want to go on like a huge uh, dive onto the, the coronavirus this episode, although people are thinking about it. Um, you know, next week we're actually going to have a, uh, a woman who was an expert. Um, she worked um, countering biological weapons yeah. for the CIA's counterterrorism center. So Tracy Walder will be on next week. And uh, we'll definitely, this thing will evolve quite a bit over the next, you know, seven days, I'm sure. Um, and we'll, I think it'll be timely. It'll be a timely yeah, episode with, uh, with Tracy. So we're looking forward to that. Um, in the meantime, I mean, you were mentioned to me your dad works yeah. in what, mortuary affairs? He works for an obscure government organization unit of HHS called um, the Disaster Mortuary Operational Response Team, DMORT. It's mostly um, doctors and dentists, he's a dentist, who um, are sent around the country for, as the name implies, to deal with, with high numbers of dead. Mm -hmm. So when I announced that on Twitter, it got some people's attention and freaked people out because they were mobilized to deal with the people who were quarantined on the Grand Princess. So I had one, the cruise ship off the coast of right, California, right. so I got one comment where someone said, you know, is the, are the ship full of dead and they're not telling us? And no, but not a bad conspiracy theory. What he's actually doing is um, he is there taking people's temperatures and help managing the people who are still under quarantine. 
uh, the vast majority of whom are fine, um, but they're taking their temperatures numerous times a day, I think really frequently actually, and as soon as someone develops you know, a fever, they get... Quarantined. Well, no, they get taken off to a hospital. Okay. This is a quarantine. Um, about 900 people from the cruise ship. These cruise ships are massive. They hold yeah, yeah. of people. So 900 of them went to Travis Air Force Base, and my dad is one of the staff now, people there who are frequently, you know, have medical backgrounds, and he's doing the, the swabbing and the... Um, well, the swabs haven't arrived yet. So I'm getting, like, live information from him because they're waiting for the tests. The tests haven't arrived. So there's a BuzzFeed story this afternoon, people on the cruise ship in the quarantine on Travis Air Force Base who got off the cruise ship are complaining that they haven't been tested. Well, they're like everyone we're, we're else. We're running out of test kits. There's, no, there's just not enough yeah, tests. across the country. So they're just taking people's temperature. But the good news that I took away from it is underneath the top of government, there are these obscure organizations that are running things very well. And mm-hmm. it sounds very professionally run. And, you know, he's been, uh, he went after Katrina and some of the other Gulf Coast hurricanes to identify bodies of, of victims. And in this case, it's a very different thing. And he's just been telling me he's very impressed by how professionally it's being run. Yeah, well, it's being run by, like, doctors and, and scientists yeah. and things like that. So they're yeah. pretty, you But know. they have no control. No matter how professional <laughs> they are, they have no control of the fact that six weeks have gone by and there aren't enough tests. Right, right. We're, we're like, what are, everything we're doing is like three steps behind, Yeah. you know, because I think they don't want to scare the public. Yeah. Um, even though as, as bad as it would be to institute something like what they did in Italy would probably be the like thing to do. It's it, sensible. Thing yeah, it'd probably be a sensible, responsible thing to do. But then on the flip side, you got to ask, you know, would Americans tolerate that shit? <laughs> you know? Yeah, not very well, I don't think. No, no. No. Depends on the part of the country. And maybe. they're tr- they're trying to keep people calm. They're trying to keep the markets calm. I think. Yeah. Um, but they might be able to not. They might not be able to plug that uh, that leak for much longer. Um, if you're looking at the statistics and how the cases are ramping up very quickly. So right. All right. This uh, this next week's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. Yes. I've been having calls all week. Been writing like frantically <laughs> and there's uh, a couple articles I posted um, the my, so my day job you know writing as a, as a journalist uh, there's a couple articles up on the website I work for is connecting vets if you go and look at it um, and there's a lot of good stuff on there um, I wrote an Great article stuff. about um, uh, how how the virus will affect military readiness and I talked to uh, Doc Rocky Farr, who's a bit of a special forces legend. He's uh, also a doctor, um, professor of pathology. And I talked to um, the the woman I had mentioned a moment ago, Tracy Walder, mm-hmm. and another retired CIA officer, Sam Faddis. And so you'll hear their voices in that article. And some they have some interesting, you know, professional um, views okay. uh, of it. Um, you know that I think is uh, worth people's time. But that's, uh, that's about all I wanted to say about that. I think we're going to get into it much deeper on the next episode. Makes sense. Radio Free Brooklyn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you, everyone, again, for joining us live tonight. Really appreciate it. Um, again, we're here with Michael Ames. He's the author of American Cipher. He is a journalist. You see that? Here's the, here's the paperback. The paperback just, just came out. Yeah. And uh, so I interviewed you a while back, Michael, like what, like not a year ago, was it? Was it a year ago? It was a little, it was like last April, so a little less than a year ago. Okay, April okay. May, yeah. 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 When, when your book first came out, and I was kind of shocked by some of the stuff you, you had to say, and at the time I had not read it. I finished reading it this week. It's really amazing. Um, but I wanted, I guess I wanted to ask you, first of all, like what's been the response to this book since we published it almost a year ago? Yeah, I mean, it's been interesting. Um, the response has been, on one level, uh, well, there's good news and bad news. Mm-hmm. The, I'll do the bad news first. The bad news is that it's been largely ignored. I think it's been ignored by a lot of the powers that be. I think there's a lot of uncomfortable realities that we talk about in here uh, that make a lot of different institutions look bad, um, whether it's the media, whether it's the Army, whether it's the Pentagon, whether it's... Um, you know, other podcasts, you know, a lot of, a lot yeah, of yeah. institutions that were involved in this come off looking not great. And it's not, it's not like a, a partisan gotcha kind of book. No. You know, you, you went after Fox News with CNN, 
Um, I, you went especially hard on that, uh, yeah, serial podcast yeah. and um, uh, Catherine Bigelow and, and Mark, Bowl. Mark Bowl. Yeah. yeah. And you dropped the hammer on him <laughs> um, uh, for the way, in your in your view, I think, what I took away from the book is you felt that they exploited Bergdahl. I, I think Bergdahl, I think the story of Bergdahl is a story of exploitation in many ways. Um, you know, and I'll just say that, I mean, the good news is that people such as yourself and the reviewers and the people who read the book and the blurbs we have, the reception's been great. Mm -hmm. It's just been a very small, devoted... It, uh, it changed my view uh, about Bergdahl. And, um, you know, I was very angry with him and, uh, and, and, I, and I still am angry with him that he, he broke faith with his fellow soldiers and walked sure. off the base. Yeah. But my impression, you know, previously would have been that he was attempting to defect to the other side or something of that nature. Reading your book kind of changed my opinion about that, that it, it's a bit more complicated. And was the was that in your mind because that's what you had heard, or just because that's the only thing that made sense, or? I think it's a combination of things, and I think I, I was also susceptible to um, what was going around in the media, the rumor mill in the military, uh, and also um, I, I think what was especially persuasive is when his teammates went on television and, and talked about it, and they were right. they, they reiterated that point. And I don't know if they still feel that way well, or not. But. Only one of them for the most part, was the only one who reiterated that he defected. The rest of them just said what was the truth, which is that he walked off. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a political right, right. spinning of it about him being a defector, a traitor. I mean, I should, I'd also like to say at the outset, I try to say at the outset of these things, that while I think, while I'm devoted to telling the truth uh, and nothing but the facts, I in no way, my co-author and I in no way strove to defend what Bergdahl did and our book does not seek to defend or excuse what he did because as you said it's it's inexcusable to walk away from your post in a combat zone um, but that being said a lot of people decided to write Bergdahl's story for him to explain why he did what he did before he ever had a chance to get into it himself. This is uh, on page 301 on uh, Fox and Friends retired special forces officer Lieutenant Colonel Michael Waltz, he said, Bergdahl is responsible for the death of multiple soldiers that I personally witnessed. <laughs> right. I'm glad the Army is going to hold him accountable, but this is just another selfish act by a soldier who doesn't have regard for the Army and his country. Um, and then there's also the story in here about Jimmy Hatch going on television, right. who was a SEAL. Right. Uh, he went on an operation that he, he, th he thought was to rescue Bo Bergdahl. Right. His dog, he was a canine handler, mm -hmm. his dog gets killed, yep. and then Jimmy takes a round through the leg. Yeah. Um, some pretty rough shit, you know, and in his mind, he's like, you know, <clears throat> we were going there to get Bergdahl. We were going there to get, the, whatever he did, he's an American, we have to go rescue him. Right. Well, those are two different cases. Why don't we take them on one at a time? Yeah, sure. Waltz, who, by the way, is now a congressman <laughs> from Florida, and a very public, a very public congressman is with a rising stature, I think probably has eye on, on higher office. And he is, I'd say, one of many people who've used the Bergdahl story to further his own career and exploit it in ways that really, um, really get uh, well out on a limb in terms of what could possibly be true. He didn't witness anyone dying as a result of Bergdahl because that didn't happen. So that's just straight up hyperbole. Yeah, did he ever identify who these soldiers were? I think were what he was referring to in that quote is that he sent out a mission of guys. Uh, he was a Green Beret officer, and he sent out a mission uh, of men to, to inspect um, a compound in, I think it was in like Western Ghazni province. And when they got in there, it was all booby-trapped. And as, as Walt said, you know, by the grace of God, no one got hurt. No one died, but they could have. And that was an example of uh, what was happening at that time was the Taliban was, was simply uh, baiting the U.S. military. I mean, that's been going needs. on for a long time. I mean, the bad guys in Iraq by like 2005, it was like, you know, they get the cell phone chatter and they'd like, you know, leave the doors and the doors open, the lights on, and they'd have like sandbag positions inside the house and just like host guys. Right. So, you know, and I mean, I, I'm a civilian. I didn't fight in these wars. It's, that's why I love talking to you about it, because I get to hear, you know, your perspective and the fact that some of these things that are incredible stories for civilians to hear are actually 
things that were you know were fairly common. So, but those guys that Walt sent in, they they probably were lucky. Mm. They 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 weren't killed. Um, and and in you know as for so him saying that that, that he saw people die is just not true. Uh, the fact, the ongoing m myth and legend that six guys died looking for Bergdahl is also not true. And we go into that in, in the book. We interview the source of that story, who's a former uh, officer, Nate Bethay, who has, is, has a very public voice and has written a lot, but he hasn't actually revisited this particular topic since he wrote about it uh, initially. He wrote about it initially in that first week of a media frenzy when Bergdahl was initially released and he talked about the six men who died in that period of time when the army was sending everyone on these endless searches. Months right. and months and months. But months in of his mind, he believed that was he true. He believed it was true, and I later spoke to him, and he later said, um, he, didn't, he didn't write it out in a public way, but he said very openly on the record to me, and I, I quoted him in the book, and that had he known at the time of writing that what he ultimately learned from our reporting, uh, he wouldn't have said that. I first met him after I did my story for Newsweek in 2015, which was the first reporting about those searches, and it made the point that those months of searches were not real searches. Right. Just right. to clarify for everyone watching, in case that point hasn't been made clear, because this is a point that has still not been picked up by the media, it's the critical point, I think, that's been ignored about the book, and a point that serial podcasts got wrong, because even they didn't believe that there would be an effort by army commanders to intentionally hide the truth, the, the best intelligence on where Bergdahl was. That's like something only a civilian would believe that the military wouldn't lie about. Would lie. <laughs> right, right, right. So, so just to clarify for everyone watching, in case they haven't read the book or read this reporting in Newsweek, what it is is within days of Bergdahl's disappearance, overwhelming intelligence had him across the border in Pakistan. Uh, within days, within a week and a half. Uh, that that fact found its way into official analysis being written by by intelligence analysts, and when it was delivered to uh, generals and CENTCOM, and and the analyst for this, Amber Dock, who's the source for the book and who testified in Bergdahl's court martial, testified to this on the stand in Fort Bragg in his court martial. She wrote her her report, her analysis that Bergdahl had been taken over the border. To Pakistan, she submitted it, and it was rejected. And the defense asked her, in her 16-year career as, a, as an analyst, how many times did she have her reports rejected? One time. This was the one time. And the reason for that is they could then send men on missions to find Bergdahl for weeks and months, while claiming they didn't know where he was when they already knew where he was. Well, what were they really doing? Well, what they were really doing was fighting the war the way they wanted to fight it, and in the place they were legally able to fight it. They couldn't go on a cross-border raid and start a war in western Pakistan, which is where he was. Mm -hmm. They were using it as a, as a pretext to launch more aggressive missions and raids they weren't able to do at the time because of the rules of engagement of coin, all along the border regions. So they were able to go out there and stir up the hornet's nest and fight the war in a more effective way. And an interesting part of this is that a number of, of my sources and a number of our sources in the book ended up saying not only did they understand what, in hindsight, what had been right, done, right. but they agreed with it. So I had a source, Sergeant Johnny Rice, say to me, for the, for the initial story I did on this in 2015, I understood that Bergdahl was already gone. I, he understood that they were being sent out on these raids to find him, which were really raids to just fight the war more aggressively at that time, and he supported those decisions. And this is the this is the most controversial part of your book for for us for for the guys who served over there. The most controversial aspect maybe is that their chain of command lied on the reports that they lied to their boys and told them that these missions were about bird goal. And, I, and I've talked to you know rangers. Who was saying we, we were we were doing intense you know thirty six hour mission that was all for bird doll it's like no it really wasn't bro and that, that's that's the most controversial how part. unusual is that to do a, a long mission a prolonged to, mission? no to have a mission under false under false under knowingly false intel 
there is all kinds of funny stuff that happens. I'll give you one example, my own experience. Um, I was on a special forces team, we were in Iraq. Um, when you get a certain um, cell phone selector for a bad guy, if that bad guy, if that HVT is high on the list, if he's number three, number two, whatever, that will get swiped up by the Special Operations Task Force, by the Delta Force guys, Rangers, et cetera, all those JSOC dudes over there, right? I was on that task force when I was in Ranger Battalion. Now I'm, on, I'm with NSF. What was uh, apparently going on was that, uh, as I was told, we had the selector for, say, number two or number three in the country, and we were burying it and saying it was the selector for, like, number 45 in the country so that we got to hold on to the target. Okay. And JSOC didn't swipe it up from us. Okay. So that's just an example of the sort of like fun and games that happen. Surf wars. Um, and it gets and that is okay. Right. He, who who is he being targeted by? Is it us or them? Okay, whatever. But I have heard so many, many stories over the years of dudes inventing sources out of whole cloth. Right. Um, those reports, those con ops, they there's shit bullshit on them every day. Right. And that's right after that whole thing in Niger where uh, where people were like, oh, he falsified the con op. There's information on here that's not accurate. Right. It's like, motherfucker, every con op going up is falsified. <laughs> that stuff's not real. Right. They're putting on it because it's incentivized, right? right? So you figure out what the what the commander needs to see. Right. He might even tell you what he needs to see. And then that's what goes on the con op, not the truth. Sure. Because it's incentivized. You want to go and do ops. Uh, you need to go, you know, officers need to go and do operations so they can go on their, you know, it's a bullet on their officer evaluation report. Okay. So the whole system is incentivized yeah, to support that. We had a, I mean, there was a source in the book and an original Newsweek source who said to me, we were using Bergdahl. Bergdahl became a, a, a language code, a, a, a tool. Right, right. To, to do things, I mean, and you know much more about this uh, from experience, but in order to uh, to get the assets that they wanted at the time. Now, um, I think, well, we may never know because it's interesting the people who didn't agree to be interviewed for this. We interviewed an awful lot of people at yeah. an awful lot of levels, in as high as uh, the then Joint Chiefs of Staff, Michael Mullen, mm -hmm. and Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel, and a lot of people you know, below the general level. But who uh, uh, refused interviews? Mike Flynn, David Petraeus, Jim Mattis, all of whom were been, and uh, Stan McChrystal, all of whom were in positions at the time of Bergdahl's disappearance to get the information that he was over the border in Pakistan. We interviewed Mike Furlong, who was the highest ranking, the highest ranking civilian um, um, intelligence officer at the time, who was feeding information to Mike Flynn. It's a great part of the book. Yeah, yeah. Um, and All those strange cast of characters that kind of came out of the woodwork uh, after he went missing. Well, there were a lot of people who were able to leverage this missing soldier and crisis cash in. and cash in on it. So, you know, when we talk about guys, you brought up Jimmy Hatch, and what happened to him was tragic. And he talks about going on this mission to rescue Will Bergdahl, that I take him at his word. I take all of these soldiers yeah, at their yeah, word yeah. when they say they went to do this. And I understand why they're angry and they have a right to be angry. I just wish that they could read our book, get the full story, so that maybe they'd understand that all the anger they feel towards Bergdahl, maybe they should start looking a little bit, a little bit deeper as to what was happening in their own chain of command at the time. It's a lot easier to blame Bergdahl than it is to... Uh look back at your own chain of command and ask, you know, what the fuck was really going on here? Well, and did the people immediately above uh, Jimmy Hatch know that it was false? I don't know. I, I kind of doubt it. I doubt that someone immediately above him would lie to his face. But as long as somebody above, above, above is manipulating the intelligence, it doesn't matter. Yeah, and I mean, also, what kind of idiot really thinks, like, years later that they're, like, shunting Bergdahl around some underground railroad in Afghanistan. Like, who really thinks that's happening? Well, it was happening at the very beginning. Yeah, the first, like, like, three days. Yeah, the first, like, 48 to 72 hours. Well, like, years later? It's like, come on, man. There's, a, there's an interesting quote here in the book uh, from uh, Colonel Mike Howard in July of 2009. I think this was a teleconference with... Uh, who was this with? 
Oh, the one that Bird with Bob. parents were on. Yeah, with Bob Birdall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Birdall, for the first <coughs> time in my career, I have the resources I need to do my job. That's pretty chilling, I think, if you really sit back and think about it, because he had all these resources pushed to him, all you know, what, whatever he needed. Yeah, there was an amazing moment that reminds me of uh, in the court martial in Fort Bragg when the the, uh, the aviation colonel in charge of the um, the helicopter, uh, I don't, I'm not going to get my terminology right here, but I'll call it the helicopter flotilla. Or, or that's not, what is it called? Um, squadron. Which helicopter? Well, he was the colonel in charge of all the helicopters in Patika province at that time. Oh, it probably um, was like a squadron or a task force or something like yeah, that. Yeah, and, and, and he was asked, uh, when they set up their asset, his asset, when he put all those birds in the sky to find Bergdahl, how large a, an operation was that? And he said it was the most helicopters he'd ever seen in the sky at any point since Operation Desert Storm in the early 90s. It's insane. And like that moment that you just called out, to me, that, that spoke volumes. Because here they were able to say, we're looking for this soldier, when really what they were doing was taking the war to the enemy in the way they wanted to, that they couldn't until they had this opportunity. So that marks the first moment when Bergdahl was exploited for other means, for other op opportunities. His crisis became someone else's right. opportunity. right. Bergdahl's crisis became other people's opportunity every step of his story, starting with the U.S. military um, you know, using the intelligence as a pretext to fight the war they wanted to, and for the Taliban itself, um, obviously, to use him as a, as a bargaining chip uh, for, their, you know, for the ultimate uh, prisoner exchange. Mm -hmm. And when he came back, he was exploited by the Obama administration that tried to make you know, Susan Rice very... Notoriously tried to make him sound like he was something of a hero, perhaps that he was, you know, uh, not what he was, which was someone who deserted for completely mysterious reasons. Um, and then uh, very quickly thereafter, literally the next day, Richard Grinnell, our current acting director of national intelligence, and I just wrote about this this week for Politico, um, exploited him for what became what he's most famous for in St. America, which is... As, as this notorious deserter or possibly traitor who Obama traded five and, and Taliban. Grinnell was running like a, a PR firm at the time. Grinnell is a longtime um, Republican operative. He worked for, uh, he, was the, he was the communications aide for uh, a series of um, ambassadors to the UN in the Bush administration. And uh, when Obama came into office, he was running a little... Um, a little press shop with a deputy. They were just, as far as I know, it's just the two of them. And Grinnell went on Fox News the day after Bergdahl was recovered and said that he had been told that Bergdahl went looking for the Taliban. Well, we can trace back where that rumor comes from. It was likely a rumor from a mistranslated uh, chatter that was transcribed uh, into official intelligence logs that made its way into WikiLeaks. Um, but the fact is, it, it, and that's a longer story that I think people should read the book to hear, but the fact is, is Grinnell didn't, I don't think, care whether or not right, it was true, right. nor did uh, whoever told him. It's just, ah, this, this is a perfect rumor that we can start putting out there to make this trade look politically as bad as possible. And as I was reading through, you know, there's, there's a chapter or chapters that detail um, this sort of like propaganda campaign that took place in the media. And as I'm turning the pages, I'm turning the pa I'm just waiting for one name to come up, just waiting for it, just waiting for it. And then there it is on 270. Eclipse Groups reports that Dewey Claridge shared with Fox News. Like, of course. <laughs> and, you know, this is, uh, it, it confuses people. So the headline... In Fox, in, uh, it was Fox News Washington correspondent James Rosen. The headline was, Bird Doll Declared Jihad in Captivity, Secret Documents Show. And this is uh, interesting because you saw it with the, uh, the SEAL dossier, is that it confuses the public when you say secret documents, when you say um, <clears throat> MI6 operative pens secret dossier. Sounds very official and very classified, right? Yeah. The dossier, the Steele dossier, of course, was a former MI6 guy doing his own thing, commercial endeavor, 
and he penned this thing. It, it was not an MI6 document. It was not an intelligence right. briefing. It was right. none of that. Right. The same with this. These, these quote-unquote secret documents were right. a private intelligence network. They were not CIA. They were not DIA. Worse than that, not only were they a sort of private, um, you know, there was no one governing them, there was, there was no like official government process they had to go through, but some of them were recycled from the prior hostage being held by the counties in the same place to Bergdahl, who was Road. David Rode, yeah. who was, who was uh, a journalist and currently um, an editor at The New Yorker, and at the time he was an editor at The New York Times. And um, this is another interesting piece of the, of, of the timeline, which is that David Rode escaped his right, captivity right. nine days before Bergdahl wandered into his own captivity. So... <laughs> so Fucking musical chairs. Yeah, I mean they the you know, and so the these private um, I don't know what you want to call them private spies or private contractors who are out there getting this information getting information the same way the army gets information by the way which is paying people for it um, very, uh, very often uh, we're just getting information that was frequently Taliban propaganda. I mean, right, right. These ideas that Bergdahl, um, not just. Uh, uh, what do you call it, converted in captivity, but changed his name and was teaching bomb-making seminars. The, this Taliban commander... Abu Bergdahl. <laughs> Abdullah Bergdahl <laughs> taught him how to use his Nokia phone to set off a bomb. I mean, the whole thing's absurd. But at the time, there wasn't any information, so it gets out there. And that particular... There's a reason that that got out there, though, eventually in Fox News. Because Dewey Clarence, at that point... Had his contract had run out, and he needed his Pentagon money. He needed his bread butter. Everyone who, who, who exploits Bergdahl every step of the way is doing it for some other motive. I, I was told that a lot of the conspiracy theories about Obama being like, you know, a secret Muslim communist and stuff came from Dewey Claridge. Because, yeah. he, because he was pissed off that he wasn't getting the contracts he wanted. Sure. Yeah, I, I would believe it. I mean, you know... Um, Rest in peace, Dewey. I talked to yeah. him all the time on the phone. He was an interesting man. He's a legend in his own right. Yeah. And, and, and I understand why. Uh, why he's a legend for people in that line of work. In this case, though, he, I, I think, was someone who didn't care if, if, uh, if you know, if, if he had to break a few, um, you know, if he had to break a few eggs to make this omelet. He was just jaded to that point. Though. He was jaded to that point. And, of course, what that ended up resulting in, Fox News runs this story about you know, Bergdahl being um, uh, a full sympathizer and fully working and collaborating with the enemy. And within two days, you have death threats across the entire town I used to live in, the entire county. I mean, just the amount of threats that poured into Bergdahl's hometown was just incredible. And I don't think, I don't think Dewey cared. And I think the point was to score political points and for Dewey to make it look like he was still in the game. Right, right. But to go on about just more steps of this exploitation, yeah, yeah. I'd like to just, because then I think it takes an interesting turn when, when Bergdahl does come home and he gets called, I think it was two days or three days after he lands, by Mark Bull, the screenwriter. So how does Mark Bull get his number two or three days after he lands? That's a mystery that um, we did not solve, but uh, it seems... But it, 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 it reasons that it was through Bergdahl's uh, stepmother, who is a, you know, also a character, or uh, not stepmother, um, adopted godmother, sort of okay. godmother, um, who is a character in the book, uh, a figure in his life, a very important figure in his life at that time in his life. And she had contacts in Hollywood, and she was the only one at that time when he came back who he immediately turned to. You know, he, she was one of his first phone calls. Um, so... Bergdahl, now somewhat famously, starts talking to Mark Bull at length, admitting what he did. And it was for research about this film that Mark Bull wants to make, supposedly telling Bergdahl's side of the story. And Bergdahl is just so naive. <clears throat> he's so naive, he just starts talking. And he's traumatized. He's a traumatized prisoner. I mean, the guy spent five years in, in solitary confinement, right. over three of which in a cage. Not speaking English to anyone. Right. And it's, a, it's very difficult for people who have uh, never been in that part of the world to understand just how austere it is. Uh, it, and, I, and I like bouncing back and forth, like coming back just for, you know, a, a normal guy like me, 
going from a place in Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan and then coming back to the United States, it's a very jarring experience. Yeah. Now, what Bergdahl went through where he was in isolation for like five years. Right, five years. That's like a significant amount of, you know, psychological trauma and, <coughs> and talk about fucking transitions. One of the most haunting things I've heard, um, I heard or learned through this entire thing was, um, and I say entire thing, I reported this, this, you know, was, uh, five years of my life. Um, uh, from uh, when I first started reporting it. And something I will never forget was um, in the court martial sen uh, sentencing hearing, they played a recording of Bergdahl's voice in the first few days that he was in, in Ramstein mm -hmm. in Germany. And we had already at this point in the courtroom heard him speaking, so we knew what his voice sounded like. And then they play this recording of Bergdahl uh, within the first five days of his recovery, and it was a completely different human voice. It was an, at least an octave higher. It was completely strained. It had a very bizarre cadence and rhythm that was almost lacking. I mean, the way Amber Doc describes it in the book is it was like the lack of any language. He had trouble speaking English when he came back. He had back. trouble speaking when he first came back, yeah. and that's when this was re when this was recorded. And it was recorded, and I will tell you, that, that I, I still gives me chills thinking about it, because it was so clear that this was someone who had, I mean, his vocal cords had basically atrophied. Right. And you combine that with the stress and the trauma of what he had been through, and he could, he sounded like, it was, his voice was like a broken instrument. And then you're suddenly back in the United States where we got double stuff Oreos and double quarter pounders. I mean, it's like, it's shocking. It really is shocking coming from one culture to the next. Yeah. So he starts talking to this Hollywood screenwriter who tells him he's going to tell his story. And he's naive enough to believe it. And who knows? Maybe that is what Mark Bull wanted to do initially. But that's not what he ended up doing. What he ended up doing was telling a story that was much more in line with the Pentagon's version. Of right. This. And, he, and he just handed over the recordings to Serial. He handed over the recordings to Serial. We don't know how that, you know, transaction, don't know the details of that transaction, but um, they played them in the very first episode of, of the podcast. It's Bergdahl self-incriminating. And, and this was before his trial also. Correct. This was not only before his trial, this was... The, the first episode of Serial literally aired the, the, the Thursday before the weekend that the Army was making the decision on whether or not to send him to a general court-martial or as his um, and, and, Article and 32 did, did this podcast help them make that decision? According to our sources, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> because, I mean, that is the way the Army operates to a certain extent. Like, would it? If, well, I mean, it's uh, it's like the whole Gallstein thing where, like, they were going to sweep that under the rug, but then he went on Fox News and, like, de facto confessed to it. And then the Army is like, well, fuck, we got to charge him now. Yeah. It's like, man, if you just shut up. Right. <laughs> They're trying to cover it up for you, dude. Right, right, right. <laughs> Let it go. Yeah. Um, well, so, yeah, I think, I think after that podcast came out, the Army is like, eh, well... We kind of, you're, you're like, you forced their hand, you know? Well, Fox News was forcing their hand with its reactions to, because the Army was basically doing this by the book. And if you did this by the book, as General Dahl did in his 15-6 report, you saw that Bergdahl, while making an epic, epically catastrophically bad decision, <laughs> historically bad decision, was not a traitor. Right. Was right. not even intending to defect. Because the... Uh, or, uh, I'm sorry, not even intending to desert. Because desertion it, it, it implies... Uh, he was like trying to build a wall. ...of desertion is that you're planning on leaving without coming back. So what he eventually pled guilty to was, was only leaving for 24 hours for a day. Um, and so as the Army starts to do this by the book, politically it's just not playing well. And John McCain made a threat that there were going to be hearings if there was not a full court martial and if there was no punishment, and it just it it carried on and on. Um, everyone who could further their position through Bergdahl's story did that. And 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 someone watching this could say, well, isn't that what Ames and Farwell did in their book? And I what 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 we have said all along is, uh, but we are the only we are the only ones who have told this story completely straight. And we know we have because everyone comes out looking back. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought the the stuff with um with, with Mark Bull and I, I don't know the guy from Adam, but I mean it all seems kind of par for the course with uh, Zero Dark Thirty 
where the administration made the CIA open the doors and bring them in. And it's oh, yeah. like these these people were selected to make a propaganda film yeah. to bolster the official story yeah. that they were spoon fed. Yeah. And they made it. And when that movie, when I, I finally did watch that movie, I was like, they it's like got like the Chapman bombing in it. It's yeah. got the enhanced interrogations. Like, like where the fuck are they even getting this from? Like, this is like bizarre. They're just like throwing all this stuff together. Well, there's good history that's been done about that. I mean, Jason Leopold um, and um, a historian named Trisha Jenkins, and we, you know, we cite their reporting in the book to the degree to which Mark Bull and Catherine Bigelow were 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 really played by the CIA. Yeah, yeah. And what they didn't realize at the time was that people they were dealing with who they thought were just inviting them in and you know and and opening the doors for them were actually undercover. Were actually on an assignment. Well I mean again, like how stupid do you have to be? Like of course this is IO. Like they are putting it's P, or PR would probably be the lawful term for it. And then if you're making a movie, you probably don't really care. The point is you make the movie. Right, and you can say, we had access. And, and of course, when people have criticized Bull about Zero Dark Thirty, his defense was, well, it's just a movie. But but Bigelow would say, we took a documentary approach to it. I remember her saying that yeah. in an interview. It's like, yeah. no, you didn't. Yeah. This is a bunch of weird stuff you stitched together. And it was so egregious that Michael Morell wrote an open letter right. on the CIA website saying this movie is not reflective of what this agency did. Which I've never heard of a, a director doing that. Amazing. Like they usually just say nothing, yeah. absolutely nothing about it. Why do you think he did that? I think because the because of the interrogation. That that, that could have been that scene. I, I think there's probably a number of things, but I think um, a couple different things probably played into it. But I think the agency um, also wanted to. It, it probably at, at at its heart it had a lot to do with who got to take credit for what. Yeah. Because the movie makes it seem as if there's this one renegade female officer that basically pushed the agency to do this like unorthodox, you know, methodologies and finally found Bin Laden when in reality it was a more, you know, holistic, it was a team effort. It really was kind of a, a team effort. It wasn't one person. It wasn't just one person in the agency. And I suspect that was maybe what upset them more than anything was that it made it seem like it. there's this one singular person rather than right. the team. Yeah. Well, um, so all of these, just to sort of tie it all together, where, where we've been going, all of these people, institutions, and actors leverage Bergdahl for their own, their own purposes. Um, and one of the reasons that it matters to me is because of my background in the story, which is that I lived in Bergdahl's hometown. The reason I wrote this in the first place was because of Bob Bergdahl, who's the character in the book, mm -hmm. and the central figure in the book, and we have pictures of in the book, was my UPS driver. When I lived in Idaho, but so I, 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 you know, this is a personal connection, and I'm writing about someone who I knew personally and who I knew as a human being, and not just a, a character right, right, right. for football. And I'm curious, since you recently finished the book, how he came across to you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, get, I had always my impressions, of course, were very limited, just from like seeing him in those press conferences, where I thought they were very, very weird. Where you know he has the big beard and the skull cap, and it's kind of like. Well, what the fuck is going on here? Um, well, reading the book, I mean, I think what comes across about Bob Bergdahl is um, you get the sense that he's this very um, strict uh, religious disciplinarian type figure. Um, but what also comes across in it is, I mean, he really loved his son. Yeah. Uh, and he'd do anything for him. And there's this part, part in the part of what you write about in the book was like he was going to go do like some renegade like vigilante shit in, in the federally administrated areas of Pakistan. Bob was. Yeah, to try to get him back. <clears throat> yeah. And so I mean, Bob never lost faith in his son and, and fought for him. You know, the, the entire time, and uh, that was that was pretty amazing. And it, and it's interesting too because it seems like Bob and and Bo had a very contentious relationship. Um, all, all, all along, like they, that, you get the impression they weren't particularly close, right? Well, I think they were close, but in a way where it was all, it was there was a lot of butting heads. It was tough love. Yeah, it was, yeah. And, it, and a way not that dissimilar from a lot of you know um, fathers and sons, uh, just more intense perhaps than 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 fully average. But I I don't I wouldn't say they 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 had a, a bad relationship. Um, I'd say they're just very strict, very, very old school. Yeah. 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 But I mean, also, you know, uh, Bob 
really seemed to believe strongly in, in teaching his kids values. Yeah. And uh, and that comes through, and and it, and it seems to come through in both. Like he he he's not amoral. Um, that that's not who he is. But at the same time, like there's something broken inside. You know, there's just something that's not quite clicking. Well. Um towards the end of the book, you know, and I really encourage people to, you know, read to the end, learn about Bob. People will remember seeing Bob, and if they need a refresher, there's a photo insert in the book, and they'll remember, and, they'll, and they might think, oh yeah, I thought mm -hmm. this guy was weird for all these reasons, but when they learn about what he went through and how intense he was, and you learn about how similar they were, right? Bo came up with this idea that was fairly delusional, that he was going to save the lives of his buddies in the platoon, by going on this stunt to walk to another base in the middle of the night to report bad leadership. Really um, way out there. there there's the an, an, an aspect that he's completely morally inflexible um, to the point totally. of absurdity. But in his mind, he right. was right. That was the right thing to do, and he had to do it. And his own anxiety built until the point that he just had to do it. And he did something insane and reckless and incredibly dangerous. I mean, it's, you know, a borderline death wish. Um, and then what, what you'll learn towards, towards the end of this book is that Bob was going to do something almost exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bob was so committed to rescuing his son and knowing that it was the right thing to do and that he would do anything and he would stop at nothing to get his son back, that he was growing out his beard, he was learning Pashto, yeah. and he was connecting himself to the right people, that he was going to fly to Pakistan or to Kabul and to start piecing together things and doing it like with a series of, of notes. He met someone who told him that, that who gave him a, a note of safe passage that he could present to someone in one of these feudal kingdoms in coast <laughs> and that that would get him into Pakistan. And people in the U.S. intelligence um, world who knew Bob had to say to him, you know, this isn't going to work. They're not going to, because Bob's plan was they'll take me and free my son. And what Bob's contacts in the U.S. intelligence told him is, no, they're just going to take both of you. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, and knowing Bob and knowing how, uh, how I went from knowing him as my, I mean, have you ever become friends with a UPS driver? Not really. UPS is an interesting company. They treat their employees very well if their employees do their job very well. Bob didn't miss a day of work for something like 26 years, 28 years, I forget, it's in the book. And he was extremely diligent. And they're all about efficiency. They were one of the first companies, you know, to do... And Bob's you know, like super well disciplined in his life. Did this. And Bob's super disciplined. You know, he built a barn for his horses and his young family miles out a out, uh, desert canyon. And I, I knew him as this UPS driver who was diligent and who was always on time and always on schedule. And he was able to retire and take that same mindset into this single mission of saving his son. And I think not only is it um, wrong and kind of gross to uh, cast aspersions on him for doing that, but I actually think it's kind of beautiful in a way that no one in our media was willing to really grapple with. You know, there was a fight, I'll never forget, on MSNBC on Morning Joe that week after he was recovered. There was an on-air, like, argument that blew up between, I think, Chuck Todd and Joe Scarborough about this. Because Joe Scarborough started saying, he actually said, he's a bad father. And Chuck Todd, uh, I, I, in my memory it was Chuck Todd, kind of uncharacteristically kind of lost his temper and said, you can't say that. And... And Chuck Todd was right, and we didn't even have the information at the time. But when, when we, I mean, it, it's, it's worth noting, if you want to know the parent, Bo Bergdahl's parent story, yeah. this is the only place it's been written. Yeah, it, it's, it's fascinating how, like, they literally lived out in the middle of nowhere. Um, like, there's all this, like, surreal stuff about how they made friends with these Peruvian cowboys, essentially. Uh, shepherds. Yeah, shepherds. Yeah. I mean, but, I mean, they're, like, out there working the land. It's like, it's like going back in time 100 years. Farwell and uh, my co-author Matt Farwell and the late Rolling Stone reporter Michael Hastings interviewed them in depth in 2012 for the Rolling Stone story, which mm -hmm. was the first big in-depth story on the Bergdahl case. They then talked to a variety of media trying to, you know, 
stir up interest in their son after that Long Stone, Stone story came out. But after his son was recovered and after they turned into pariahs and they were used and exploited by Richard Grinnell and Dewey Claridge and turned into something they are not, which was um, Taliban sympathizers, which is absurd. Which is very odd. That It's very uh, ironic, I guess, that Taliban propaganda ended up being a Fox News talking point. Oh, yeah. Successfully so. Yeah. And that did not... Um, escape the notice of you of really smart people in US military intelligence. <laughs> you know, sources of ours saying what it was like to turn on Fox News and watch what they knew was Taliban propaganda being repeated by patriotic, you know, right, right. ostensibly patriotic Americans. And that I think goes to show how how effective Taliban propaganda is, but also how broken our own it's, political It's how broken system. our system is because it's like, if I can use the enemy's propaganda to get at the other party, I'll do it. Sure. And we've been doing that in other countries for years and now it's, it's being done yeah. to us by, yeah. you know, just by everyone. But just to finish that thought um, about Bob is, is a after their son was recovered, they went totally dark. They were put under FBI protection. Mm -hmm. They didn't talk to anyone until they spoke to me um, shortly before the book was finished. And they put a lot of faith in me and Matt Farwell to tell their story the right way, and we were honored. And if they're watching this, you know they know that we were honored that they um, put that faith in us to tell their story because what they went through was a horrific ordeal. Jim Mattis is someone who ends up actually also you may have picked up on that became close to them. Um, yeah, yeah. He wouldn't come out and say he said it in public a little bit that first week. He went on CNN and he said, "Hey, everyone needs to lay off the family." He should have probably come out and said even more, but Bob, him, him and McMullen seemed like they both. McMullen, were, yeah, 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 Mullen, yeah, Abra Mullen. They got pretty close to the family. Yeah, and they came out and said a few things. They, they, you know, in hindsight, they probably didn't realize how bad the smear campaign that Grinnell started was going to get. So what they said ended up just getting, you know, drowned out. But what, you, what, what we learned and what they learned is that these, you know, this was a good family of, ironically enough, Repu lifelong Republicans, <laughs> um, a military family. Religious you know. family. Yeah, their daughter married a Navy aviator. Um, they, have, they have military throughout their family, and they just were trying to get their son back um, in ways that, in some ways, on paths that were laid out for them by the POW movement in the 70s. And we go into, into some detail about that and also in ways that were really groundbreaking. And that, you know, God forbid this happens to another family, they will be able to look at what the Bergdahls did, and the Bergdahls will have left lessons for other people about how to get their loved ones back. And they will, I'm sure, always help anyone who's in a similar situation. Guys, people watching this, uh, if you have any questions for Michael, uh, please drop them in the comments so that we can get them out there. Um, otherwise, thanks for joining us tonight. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Um, that helps us out. Um, there's all kinds of links down in the description. There's probably a link to Michael's book, but if not, you can find it on Amazon. Here's the hardcover right here. Michael's holding up the, uh, the soft cover, the uh, paperback that just came out. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening. Yeah. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for your ongoing interest in the story. I mean, I'd, I'd like to say, while the media has really sort of wanted this to go away and is happy for Bergdahl to be this deserter, maybe traitor guy, as opposed to um, someone who made an incredibly bad decision but then survived five years captivity, escaped numerous times. And when he comes back, he, uh, yeah, he did some dumb things. He talked to a Hollywood uh, screenwriter, but he also was the single greatest source of, of actionable intelligence in the Fatah of anyone. So it was a gold mine. That, that was actually something I wanted to ask you about that I, I, I kind of picked up on when I was reading the book. But I wanted to ask you, like, was he really a gold mine of intelligence? Because, I mean, this dude was literally being held in a, in a steel cage. For, for the last three for, years. For the last three years. So I'm a little curious how this guy was a gold mine of intelligence. Well, was it that or was it that once we had an American out of there that our strike packages could change? Because we don't have to worry about killing him anymore. I think it's a little bit of both, but I do think he's such a unique mind, and his memory is so good and so photographic, and um, his his um, 
you know, lead intelligence analyst, Amber Dock, was such a good questioner that the two of them made an incredible team of producing intelligence because she could encourage him to really get into his mind and get into those memories and remember the sounds about where he was. She would ask him, could you hear cars on the road? Was it a paved road or a dirt road? Did you hear children? Did you hear animals? And by putting all these things together, they could actually pinpoint in, what, in I, I think, three or more cases, little mud huts that he was being held in. Wow. Different structures that, they, that he was being held in, they were able to pinpoint. And in the months after he was recovered, then that combined with the fact, to your point, that there's no longer an American mm-hmm. there, and all of a sudden, you know, the drone program is having a very successful summer. Right, right. It's wild stuff, man. Um, and what do you know about, you know, Bo today? Like, I, I mean, I'm not asking for his home address or anything, but yeah, like, what, I don't, I don't, where, I, I mean, how's he doing? What's he, what's he up to? <clears throat> so I, I don't know much. I, I, I truly don't. Um, obviously, he remains someone who a lot of people don't like and would wish harm on. Yeah. Um, so I only get the littlest, um, you know, kind of like aside um, remarks about how he's doing. And all I can say is during the, during the court martial, he really clearly, to those of us in the courtroom, wasn't doing well. You could see it. Mm-hmm. It was a miserable process mm-hmm. to put him through. I mean, not only is he tangentially involved in people's injuries that the army never fully and like they, they brought people who were like quadriplegic up on the stand well, like, the wife of, like you did this to my husband right and, right and of course they were able to do that it's worth noting because the trial because it didn't go to trial had it gone to trial there could have been a question from the defense of is he actually responsible for cross examination is he responsible for this or is the person who sent this mission out without preparation responsible for this man's injury. Right. Who's responsible? Um, that never, those questions never really got to be answered because he pled guilty. Mm-hmm. And by pleading guilty, he then threw himself at the mercy of the court, and these people who, 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 who suffered unquestionably um, uh, were able to, to, it ended up being sort of a, this kind of like macabre and awful, um, like, suffering competition. You know, everyone involved suffered horribly. And the prosecution's point was that it was all because of Bo Bergdahl. And the defense's point, which they never got to take to trial, was, no, it's because of the way the war was being done. <laughs> and I, I personally found that case more compelling, and so did the judge. Um, and, uh, but to your question, he looked pretty bad at times during that because he was going through something that was just, A, made him feel horrible, about everything he had been through, re-triggering, reliving his trauma, so he's repeating that trauma over and over again in the courtroom. Um, and not only that, but a big part of his defense was talking about his psychological health and his mental health. So they're just opening and dissecting his entire life in front of, you know, on the record for history in the public. So he looked like someone who, uh, you know, however bad the five years in captivity was the trial of, or the sentencing, I should say, was pretty miserable too. And all I've heard in the last year or so is that he's starting to do better. And I think, you know, just as, as a person, that's a good thing to hear. And you hope that, you know, he gets some semblance of a life back. You think he's out just camping out in the wilderness like he was when he was a teenager, just he, he, taking it all in? He always was a loner and I, I mean, loner's not even the right word. He always was someone who was who was strong and, and on his own and could be on his own. Um, he'd probably do very well in this quarantine situation. Where I, <laughs> um, I never got to know him very well. I knew him as another person in the town that I lived in for ten years, and I, I recognized him. But um, I think he's I, I think he's just trying to get on with his life, mm-hmm. and it'll be very interesting to know. You know, we've, you and I have had conversations about Bobby Garwood uh, or about William Calley. And it'll be very interesting to know 10, 15 years from right, now right. what people say about Bo Bergdahl in that context. Garwood was, uh, he was an interesting guy I wrote about once. He was, um, uh, he was in the Army in Vietnam. And uh, how everything went down is very murky, right? How did he get captured by the VC? We don't really know. Um, what they're they calling him the white... White, white calm. White calm. <laughs> uh, he's still alive. 
Yeah, he, he supposedly he's, he's still out there. Um, he'd be like in his seventies, like mm-hmm. 75, 78. I met people who know him. Oh, this. really? Yeah. He, uh, you know, there's another um, another journalist. He has contacts in the POW world, which is interesting. It's very interesting right? um, because they 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 know what he did, and yet they also are aware that he was a prisoner. And it seems that there's this very, you know, there's this tension there of, well, he's one of ours and he's a prisoner, but he also made a lot of really bad mistakes. And you compare his mistakes to Bergdahl's, Bergdahl made one really bad mistake. Garwood made years of, mis- of mistakes. The, the difference is that Garwood acted as a trustee for the, for the North Vietnamese communists. I mean, he really did go over to the other side really and work for them. <clears throat> yep. um, and uh, it's pretty well documented that he, he... He did time when he came back, right? No. No? No. It was like, it was like, go away. Wow. Yeah. He really wanted to go away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, he, he actually took up arms and carried arms out on, like, on uh, NBA patrols. That's wild. Yeah, and one of the things what I was able to write about was I got after action reports from a Marine recon patrol that came face to face with Garwood in the jungle. And that's what was in your story. Yeah. It was pretty amazing, yeah. And I started like trying to, uh, from uh, taking those after action reports, and then I started taking um, the POW reports from other American POWs that were in the camps with him. And there's like this time period, two weeks when he was gone, that just happened to intersect with the patrol. Even the type, like the type of clothes he was wearing, were the same. Report of so I was able to like piece yeah. together, like yeah, it's definitely him. Yeah. So here you have an actual person who committed treason, and was able to come back and live his life. So the fact that we know so little about Bo because he has to be so careful is a shame. And I just hope that years from now he is able to get back to a semblance of life because yeah. he did his time. He did his time. And the soldiers who make a lot of, you know, you've talked to some of them who've gone on the record quite a bit, talk about their anger towards him. But other soldiers who were closer to him have, have forgiven him. It took them some time, but they have forgiven him. And I hope, I hope people... Who, who can read this, and I hope more people who served in Afghanistan at that time and can walk around and say, I went on missions looking for Bo Bergdahl, will learn the full history of maybe what those missions were about and can find forgiveness in their own hearts for him as well. I, uh, I, I was talking to you before we, uh, we went on air that I feel like a lot of the anger, and I, I completely understand the anger from the guys in his platoon, but I feel like a lot of it is that it, it, it's because they want... Bergdahl to make sense like the reason why he walked off the fob if he was trying to defect that would make sense There's like a certain logic there but The reason why he really walked off the fob that night Doesn't make any fucking sense and it's like trying to you know cram a, a, a round peg into a square hole like it, it's just not happening and Because you're not able to understand the logic behind it like I, I would just get more and more angry right but, and I would feel like you're lying to me because, like, that doesn't make any fucking sense. Right. Like, what the hell are you talking about, Michael? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you want to talk about briefly, um, like, why he did walk off that day? Because I, I don't feel like we necessarily... I mean, do you, did you come out of the book with, a, like, a clear understanding of it? It is a hard thing. People say, well, just tell me why. Well, in the book, it probably takes five to ten pages to even explain the mindset and all the different fragments fragmented thinking yeah. and anxiety well, that built I mean, on, to on decision. On, on paper, he thought he had witnessed war crimes and thought that his platoon and his unit was completely out of fucking control, which they really weren't. It wasn't It wasn't like my... Well, there was that kicking over the grave thing. He did see that, which is not a war crime, but it was certainly a crime against cultural... Supposedly, supposedly. I mean, I've heard different things about that. Too. I know. Well, yeah, and... I know Veerkamp, when you interviewed him, said that maybe that didn't happen, but we have plenty of sources who, who, who saw it happen. This was a, it was a battalion commander, wasn't it? Was it was a battalion commander, yeah. yeah. And, and, and there were interpreters there, and there were other soldiers there, and, and he kicked over what, was a, what, what some guys may have called a pile of stones, but what the local Afghans knew was a grave. If you've seen Afghan graves, and I, I can't speak to that incident, but like Afghan graves a lot of times, especially over like uh, in Kaust where I was, like they are like just piles of rocks. Right. Yeah. Because right. that's all that's around. Yeah. So um, he saw these things, and he, they start living in his head, and he has a rich interior life, to put it, you know, <laughs> somewhat uh, diplomatically, um, that builds into this case of my leadership is completely out of control, and they're actually insane. 
and I need to do something because they hate us so much that they're going to send us, Lieutenant Colonel Baker's going to send us on a suicide mission, and I don't want my friends to die. And if I don't go report him, that's what's going to happen. So I'm going to do this. And it is something that the Army General investigating it ultimately decides, he doesn't use the word delusional, but he said it, it, it was not grounded in reality. We didn't right. find any evidence for that. And Bergdahl comes up with this plan that he himself, after his five years, refers to somewhat jokingly or self-deprecatingly as my fantastic plan. Uh, he knew it. He, he knows it was a mistake. Right. So he comes up with this extravagant plan to hike through the middle of the night with a disguise and with money to bribe someone. And as he put it to Mark Pohl, he was going to be Jason Bourne. And he was going to be a hero. And he was going to show up at, um, at uh, not Solano, um, with the other fob. Chapman? No. Um, no, he's somewhere, he was somewhere else. Uh, right, fob, um, sorry, I'm, I'm blanking out now. But he was going to show up at the fob and he was going to immediately be a legend. Because he was going to show up in his Lords of the right, right, headscarf right. and he had come through the middle of the night and he was doing it for this morally good reason and, 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 and throw me in jail if you want to but I rest you know but I save the lives of my buddies it's so crazy like even what that psychopath Bales did makes more sense you know what I mean like you you're, you're angry you know maybe he's PTSD'd out I don't know what the deal was but he, he, he you know the guy lost his mind and retaliated and went and killed a bunch of innocent people like on the surface of it that makes more sense than Bergdahl's story I'm not saying there's a moral equivalency well, I'm just saying I mean maybe from being there for you as a soldier for me as a civilian and I think that's also interesting you know Far uh, Farwell is a combat veteran I'm a civilian to have both of our view, you know, viewpoints forming this I hear what you're saying but I think to the average civilian who questions some amount of the wars that we fight and the way that we fight them and Bird Dog gets over there and sees some of the, oh right. my God, this is the reality of the thing. You know, there was this interesting moment in, in the sentencing where the judge asks him, did you understand what your duty was? Did you understand what your mission was? Uh, and at some point, you know, Bird Dog was answering everything straight, and he kind of he kind of cracked, and he goes, well, I just thought it was kind of a joke. And, and Nance goes, you know, what do you mean? He said, well, we were manning this checkpoint on this road right. to interdict smuggling of weapons, and we could see that anyone who wanted to smuggle a weapon could just go a quarter mile down the road and just avoid our checkpoint. And if that's the way we're fighting the war, yeah. then that's hard for him to believe that he was doing what he thought he was going to do when he volunteered. Right. There's that weird like cognitive dissonance involved in how you process all of that. Like when you're part of an institution and they're telling you to do stuff that everyone knows doesn't make sense, but you go and do it. He made an incredibly bad decision. He made a decision that put other people for a short period of time in danger. He made a decision that that betrayed his buddies even though he was trying to help them, but he wasn't a coward. And if anything, he did something that was incredibly fearless. And um, however dumb it may have been. All right, so let's take some questions here. All right. Uh, cool Breeze asks, Michael, your book is excellent. Question, wasn't Bergdahl's psych discharge from the Coast Guard enough of a red flag to stop his army enlistment? Seems a very intense episode to just waver him through. Totally. Totally. Yeah. It's funny. Cool Breeze. I'm thinking about how <laughs> at that moment when he gets to the Coast Guard in New Jersey in February, it was like 35 mile an hour winds off the ocean in the middle of the winter. Um, but... Yeah, what what he he couldn't hack it in the Coast Guard, and not to take anything away from the Coast Guard, but he washed out for a reason, and the Coast Guard did its job. The Coast Guard and like they found him in basic training, like in the showers, cutting himself open. Right. Uh, he didn't cut himself, but it was a nosebleed. It was a little unclear how the nosebleed started or began. Whether he hit himself or we don't know that. The guy who found him found him bleeding, and there was blood everywhere. Um, I think maybe, I don't try to remember if it was a broken mirror, but he was, he was bleeding and, and he said, I can't do this anymore. And, and, and they took him to the health center and they gave him a, a psychological evaluation and they said, you know, you're done here. <laughs> yeah. You're done here yeah, like and you're done in the military unless you get psychological screening and clearance. It's like failure to adapt. Yeah, it was a separation 
Um, An entry level separation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, they made it very clear that he was not going to serve in any branch of the military again without screening and a waiver. And then two years later, after he puts himself through his own training, he goes to the Army recruiting station in Twin Falls, rides his dirt bike down there, and voila, that waiver goes away. It was because it was the surge, right? Yeah, it was 2008. Well, it wasn't the surge yet. It was 2008 okay. when he enlisted. But it was starting to be. I mean, it was a time when, when it was... Everything was going to shit in Iraq, and they needed bodies. But he didn't know where he was going to go. But to the point of the question, I mean, the Coast Guard did its job. <laughs> the Army managed to paper over this psychological problem, which was clear to a lot of people. You know, Bergdahl, for all of his attributes and assets as a human being, and even as a soldier, was clearly, to a lot of people, emotionally unfit to the whole situation, and especially to the social requirements of being in the Army. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people knew that it wasn't right. And the Coast Guard did its job, and you know the Army found a way around it. One point I'd like to add to this, you know, which is that the Coast Guard has divulged all of its papers to show what it did right. Um, Bergdahl has testified both in the court-martial on stand and in his, 50, in his 15 6 confessed everything he did. The only institution that has never actually come clean on this whole thing is the Army itself. And, and it's about time, I think, for people in the Army to remark on this. But I'm not if they come clean, clean, they won't be able to do it again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another question has come up. Well, someone asked about, you know, how's he doing today? We answered that. Uh, I wonder if you can compare and contrast uh, Lynch, the, I guess Jessica Lynch case, with this one. Obviously very different, but still, yeah, hard to compare those two. Well, the interesting thing about the Lynch case is the overlap with Tillman. Are you familiar with that? Was it Tillman's platoon that was on security? when they Tillman got put into some, like, Tillman ended up writing home about no, it. Tillman it was no. in Iraq, and he was put on this large, elaborate Jessica Lynch operation. Mm -hmm. And he saw how much of a PAO operation it was. He saw how much of a of a political movement it was to make it to make this out as to that she was being rescued and that she was this when really she we now know she was being guarded by Iraqi doctors, right? Um, so the Je the Jessica Lynch episode was the first thing that sort of started to disillusion Tillman, which then led to Tillman's you know, sort of a domino to fall in Tillman's history. I, and I've interviewed before uh, Stephen Elliott, who was, uh, it's debatable who killed Tillman in that friendly fire incident. Right. Uh, there's two two guys who were shooting, who one, one of the two, maybe both of them, who knows, but um, Stephen thinks it was probably him. Mm. And uh, he wrote a book about it called War Story. It's pretty hardcore. Yeah, I'd like to check that out. Yeah. But to answer the question, I mean, I just think, um, very much apples and oranges, you know. I mean, here's someone where the army saw an opportunity to take a captured soldier and make it into a story that worked. And with Bergdahl, they had no control from the beginning because he was smuggled into a situation in Western Pakistan where the U.S. just had absolutely no reach, and they had no control. You know, the Pentagon had no control over Bo Bergdahl's story from the moment he left the wire. And they really didn't have any control in the end. I mean, it was almost sort of an accident, a lucky accident for the Pentagon that it turned out the way it did. With everybody believing, well, I shouldn't say a lucky accident. Soldiers in, in, in the company were given NDAs, very famously. Yeah, yeah. And very assiduously, I mean, those NDAs went to everyone. And they said, you can't fly home until you sign these NDAs. Well, there was a reason for that. It was to scare everyone into silence. What's hilarious about that is like, I'm surprised the military still makes people sign NDAs because they're unenforceable. Right. Like, what, what are you, like, what are you doing with well, this? Well, it intimidates people. Yeah, it intimidates people, and then like people get it, and you're, oh, you signed an NDA. It's like, right, you know, and 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 good for Cody Full for breaking the NDA. You know, he was the first one to break it, and good for him. I mean, those guys who came out and told their story. You know, I've talked a lot about Grinnell politicizing it. Well, that's true, but those guys did the right thing by breaking the NDA and wanting to tell a story. The story needed to be told. 
You know, it's one of those things where, you know, uh, somebody who, you know, you and I have both spoken to in the past, but he, he was telling me how uh, in the invasion of Afghanistan, um, my old unit, 5th Group, 5th uh, Special Forces Group, they had a rule that only, that captains and enlisted guys could not talk to the press. So the ODAs could not talk to the press. And that was so that the colonels could get all the FaceTime in front of the camera and claim credit for everything they were doing. So, I mean, yeah, it's a... It's a political bureaucracy. Yeah, so, I mean, in this case, yeah, the, the enlisted guys, you make them sign NDAs, you can't talk to the press. Right. It's your patriotic duty, soldier, not right. to talk to the press. Well, what the Army was able to do with that, though, was, A, I mean, they made a lot of guys, like Cody Fuller, who was the first one to break it, angry, rightfully so, but they were also able to control people like my source, Johnny Rice, who figured out what they were doing. Right. Johnny right. Rice signed an NDA, but he knew the whole time that they were using Birdall as an excuse. So those NDAs were effective and that no one talked for five years. And then once the cap came off, it came off all at once. And I think, you know, good for them for telling the truth. And that's why I wrote that, you know, that article this week about, about Rick Grinnell. Because it was Rick Grinnell who took their story and turned it into something purely political and really weaponized it. What is, uh, where can people find that story? It's on Politico right now. Okay. Um, if you just uh, Google uh, Bergdahl and Grinnell, you'll find it on Politico. I'm going to post it in the comments right now so okay. people can go and read it. Yeah, it goes into more detail about how that whole thing went down. And it's, it's grimy, you know? I mean, these guys did what they thought they were doing the right thing, and I would say my personal viewpoint is it was the right thing. You have to tell the truth. And if the political powers that be are trying to cover that up, then the right thing to do is to tell the truth. I think, you know, um, and I, uh, I know a lot of them have said, and it wasn't political. It wasn't political. Well, that's true. Their stories were not political. They were just telling the truth. But other people made it political. And Rick Grinnell, who is a very savvy operator, who is now our current acting director of national intelligence, knew exactly how to take a story that wasn't political and make it very political. And it seems that he was rewarded for his endeavors. Oh, yeah. And I, I, I don't know, I, <laughs> I was telling you before, I, I watched an interview with Grinnell, and it's like, how is this guy the DNI, or the acting DNI? Well, how is he the ambassador to Germany first? Yeah. He doesn't speak German. And apparently the Germans hated him, and he had no idea what he was talking about over there. Apparently. Evidently. <laughs> yeah, it's unreal. I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, we always have political appointees uh, working as ambassadors, but I, I, I'm especially... But not like this. Not like this. And, and, and not also becoming then the director of national intelligence. And the point of the political story is that this Bergdahl thing was a warm-up lap for him and Trump. Him and Trump worked in concert to turn a story that to the point of the soldiers was not, you know, the point of his platoon mates, was not a political story. But Grinnell and Trump at the same time made it one. And they made it one very effectively. It's one of, you know, it, it, will, it was at the time, and remains to many people, one of the Obama administration's worst scandals. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean... Meanwhile, I mean, we, we, the Trump administration goes on to negotiate with the same five guys, and now facilitate the release of 5,000 Taliban prisoners. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, too. I mean, what do you make of that? And, and I've told you my opinion, and this is, well, it's not my opinion. It's what my source told me. It was a very good source, that those five Taliban guys that Obama released for Bergdahl, that that was all a DIA, State Department, intelli uh, information operation. It was a deception campaign. What they called MILDEC. It was a deception campaign. And that those guys were scheduled for normal release all on their own regardless, and the deception campaign was make the Taliban believe that they were only going to be released in exchange for Bergdahl. So I don't think even that happened. I don't, I don't even think the public... I don't, I don't think even the public story that he traded those guys for Bergdahl, I don't, think, I don't think that's even true. But now we're in this situation where, yeah... I mean, if I mean, that's true, what you just said, that's huge. not been reported <laughs> and it's classified and, yeah, would be quite the thing. It is. <laughs> and it, it, it was between... I mean, I always, I, I did read, and I did, I was under the impression that those five guys were always slated for re eventual release. It, it was Carol between... Rosenberg and Miami Herald wrote about how they lived separately from the other detainees. They handled themselves and handled their own detainment as prisoners of war. They were not, you know, they were not 
KSM. They were not there for life. They yeah. knew that they were going to be part of some deal eventually. Or regular release. Or according to your source, regular release. That, that it, it was CENTCOM, it was DIA, and it was State. And they put that all together and tricked the Taliban into giving us Bergdahl back. And uh, the whole, like, ju all the juicy details, I'm not really at liberty to say because people could get burned in the process of that. Um, but I, I think... I mean, that would be like an op within an op within an op. Correct. If that's true. Correct. Like, uh, like if that's true, there were parts of our own government that didn't know it was true. Correct. Interesting. And that's how it works, right? That there are some of these things that only 40 people in the entire world know about. I mean, at the time Bergdahl was released, there were probably 30 people who knew it was happening. Right. If, and if your story is, you know, checks out, there were a lot fewer than that. <laughs> Let me know the whole story. But now, yeah, th with this, this so-called peace treaty with uh, the Taliban, they're going to release, what, 5,000 prisoners? Well, it's currently being, it's currently, that's the sticking point. But, yeah, the agreement is, you know, with Bergdahl, it was five for one, and... Under Obama and now under Trump, it's five thousand for. And I, I remember, I remember the angry Fox News reports. I remember the angry uh, Boomer posts on Facebook <laughs> every day about. Uh, and let's talk about those five guys. You know, Trump calls them. You know, they were going to go back to the battlefield. They're killing Americans. No, they were never going to do that. They went to live in in condos in Doha. You know, they, we should be so lucky. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Have a condo, please. And not only that, but. Read. I mean, I did something last year when this came out for 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 time about when they about when they were captured. They were working with us. They were. They had. They they had struck agreements. They thought they were going to get amnesty because they'd struck agreements with U.S. authorities. And then when they agreed to meetings and they agreed to work with us, psych, you're going. Yeah, to yeah, tunnel. yeah. So. And yeah, much. for all the angry, all the angry, uh, you know. Facebook posts about how Obama is a traitor because he gave up these guys for a traitor and it's a dis national disgrace and now they're going to release 5,000. I don't know, again, it's just the amazing, you know... Well, and our Afghan allies, the, you know, people living in Kabul, I, I see on Twitter and they're very upset about this. It, it's just incredible to me that, you know, if there's a dig you can get on the other party, and I don't care if it's the Democrats or the Republicans, like, you dig your you heels in yeah. and go for it. Yeah. But I mean, then when your own party does something completely egregious, there's always a rationalization. It's a, yeah, but. I mean, you know, my personal view, I saw someone on, I got into a little bit of, a, of an argument on Twitter last week because somebody was saying, these are 5,000 terrorists. Well, we know enough about the Taliban. I learned enough about the war through researching this book that that's a gross simplification. You know, 5,000 of these prisoners, a lot of them are probably peasant kids. Yeah who were recruited into a rural militia. And handed a Kalashnikov. Exactly. And they got rolled up. And guess what? The end of a war is about compromises. And the end of a war is about trades that both sides don't like. And it's always painful. And no one's going to be happy. And might they go back to fight the Taliban? Yeah, they might. Might they go back and, and herd goats in their village? They might do that too. Might they go home to Pakistan? Who knows how many of them are even Afghans. But the fact is, if you want to end a war, you're probably going to have to you know, yeah. do a few things you don't want to. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, wow, man. Any more questions? I jumped the gun thinking Grinnell fixed the situation between Serbia and Kosovo. That tariff piece fell apart fast as fuck. <laughs> uh, do you know what he's talking about? Vaguely, but not oh, enough okay. to comment. Nah. I mean, there's so much dirt out there about Grinnell. Uh, I mean, the Politico story was the place that finally, I mean, it's in the book, but I, I can't get enough mileage off this anecdote that at one point I, Roger Stone was a source of mine. Uh, I'm not, a lo I, I'm not uh, rare in political journalists who had Roger Stone as a source. <laughs> Roger Stone collects political journalists. Um, and so I was able to ask him about Grinnell and this was going on, and he just said to me, I don't know anything about that. And I, I was, I, you know, I, I was asking him, like, oh, come on, you got to know something. Like, this was a big deal. And, and he just goes, no, Grinnell's too shady. I won't work with him. <laughs> Roger Stone, Roger Stone. Man. Too shady for Roger Stone. Yeah. yeah. And now he's the director of national intelligence, so sleep tight, America. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, Stone, what did he get sentenced to? 
He, he took a plea bargain. Three, he? three plus years. Flynn went down for the count. He, he didn't do he jail. He hasn't been sentenced yet. Yeah, he, has, he hasn't gotten that's, like that's any jail time. Forever. Yeah. forever. Yeah. I still have a question about Flynn. I mean, a lot of questions about Flynn, but one thing stands out in my mind from, from when all this was happening, because you, Grinnell and Trump working together on the Bergdahl story, Flynn being someone who was on the ground, and, and we know, and it's reported in our book, that Flynn was one of the people who knew Bergdahl was over the border, that all the intelligence... Right, like he knew right away. He knew right away, and he just buried that. He just ignored that. And so Flynn strikes me as a very smart, kind of squirrely guy, but not dumb. And when he got up there during the campaign, 2015, early 2016, and he said, we have an army of supporters online supporting us and carrying our message forward, he must have known by that point that that was a big... PSYOP campaign by the IRA, and maybe he didn't know it was Russian intelligence, but he must have known that this was not an organic army of supporters on Twitter and Facebook. Oh, you mean during the campaign? During the campaign. For him to go up there and say, we have an army of support out there. As an intelligence officer, there's no way I can believe that, and it's a question that has bothered me forever. That's an interesting point, uh, interesting insight, and I, I don't have any... Did he, did he convince himself of his own, like, was he smoking his own stash, like... Using his own product, yeah. Exactly, like, did he start to believe that this obvious counterintelligence operation that was supporting the campaign he was a part of was not the thing that he was in charge of doing in other countries? A a again, it goes back to what I was saying, like, if you can use it as a dig on the other party, you just roll with it, right? right? It's politics. Just, hey, man... You, you, you know, you don't look a gift horse in the mouth. <laughs> uh, I, I don't have any real strong insights the way you do on, the, on this particular subject. I just remember I went to a debate once during the campaign. It was um, both Trump and Hillary took turns coming up on stage answering questions, actually questions from veterans. Um, it was a big canned event. I felt as exploited as any of the people <laughs> that you mentioned here. Uh, it was like, let's get the veterans up there and lend credibility yeah. to this. Was it a CNN town hall? Or? Yeah, kind of. It, and it, it was broadcast, I think it was NBC. <coughs> it, was, it was Matt Lauer. Was the, oh. Yeah, he was the moderator. Yeah. Also went down for the count. Yeah. Went down hard. Um, but one of the slimiest people to go down from all accounts. Anyway, sorry. Uh, yeah, I've heard some stories too. But anyways, uh, I, it was just my observation when, when Trump and his entourage came out, um, Flynn was there with the Trump family, sitting in the, uh, in the seats there just watching oh. the debate. And I, I just never forget, the, I, I was more fixated on Flynn than I was on Trump because Flynn was just sitting there the entire time like... <laughs> very intense. But yeah, yeah, very He's intense. Very intense, dude. Uh, it, it was... It's just you get the sense he was using Trump to get somewhere. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people are. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Pence and all. Yeah. They're all trying to ride this thing into whatever comes next. Right. Um, but we, with Flynn, that was just like just a very, um, you know, casual, informal observation I made that like this guy just very stone faced watching it. And when Trump started, what was it that Trump started talking about that Flynn started freaking out? You could see it visually on his face. Really? We've got a lot about Flynn in the book. I mean, I wrote, I wrote about it in an article at the time. It was very weird to be researching this book while the Trump-Flynn thing was happening. Mm, yeah. I'd love to know. Do you remember what the moment was or what he said? Uh, I'll pull up. I'll pull up the article I wrote and I'll send it to you. I, I wrote it. I wrote it. So it's a good thing I write these things that I'm a writer, so I don't have to rely on my memory after yeah. two scotches. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it, there's something that he started talking about, and it might have been something about Russia, where like he, he started like wincing. Oh yeah. Um, Interesting. But uh, uh, the only other thing I was going to bring up, and I had brought up on our last episode, I don't know if you saw it, with, uh, with our friend Ron. And I asked Ron, I, was, I said, hey, First man, or the second Ron episode? The second Ron. I don't know if I got the second Ron. Uh, Ron, Ron Moeller returns yeah, Ron, our Ron, last Ron, episode. Ron has a big problem with our book, and I, from all I, I think Ron is a, is a stand-up guy, and I hope he and I can talk one day because... We shouldn't have any disagreement. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I love Ron. Um, and, you know, I like having you on here, too. Um, so, I mean, I'm, a, I'm like just the, the parent caught in the middle. <laughs> but um, 
I, I asked Ron. Ron's beef. I, I asked him. I, I said, "What well, what questions do you have for Michael, or what questions do you think Michael should have for you? Like, what 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 should you be talking about? What what what's the issue here?" And um, all I really got from from him, what my, what I took away from it, although he didn't use this term, is he felt that you were engaged in some sort of parachute journalism that you had. You had the story already in your mind, and then you went and collected the facts to put together that particular story. Um, oh, if only that were true. And, and Ron, you can if you're watching, you can correct <laughs> me if I'm wrong, but I, I think that was his point. If only that was true, because we lived through this. I mean, we wrote this thing and reported this thing in real time. There wasn't even time to come up with a preconceived notion. Um, but you're I mean, part of the liberal well, there's media. there's two different come on. <laughs> A few different points here. Um, one about, well, the first one about being liberal media. <laughs> one of the best sources that I had originally from Newsweek, and he's one of the best sources in this book, and he's an anonymous source in this book, is a former um, officer. Uh, I can't even say which branch he was in. Uh, he wanted the truth of this to come out, and when I first contacted him, he said, I'm not talking to you. You're obviously liberal media. And I said, how do you know that? And he said, well, I, I looked you up, I googled your name, and I saw your articles you wrote for the Daily Beast about the NRA, and you're a liberal journalist. That's and I right, said, pinko journalist. And I said, well, I said, okay, did you read the stories or just the headlines? Because I don't write those headlines. And he said, well, I just read the headlines. And I said, do me a favor, read a couple of stories and let me know if you still think I'm a biased reporter. And he did, and like a week later, he gets back to me, he goes, all right, fair enough, let's talk. So... Uh, I think it's very easy to label people. It's very easy to put people in categories in our current infotainment, political, entertainment, journalistic circus that we have in this country. Um, and I think the best writers and the best journalists out there are people who work very hard to not be able to fit into one of those categories. To the second point, Ron's point about parachuting in. Had I written this book alone, I'd say that would be a pretty... Uh, that that accusation would carry more weight, but I didn't. I wrote this book with former Sergeant Matt Farwell, who served in Paktika, and who had an on-the-ground view of what the war was like, and then who came back and served um, in a trade dock, uh, and who lost his older brother in the war, and who is, you know who understands the war on a level that I could never understand. And I learned an incredible amount from him about the war. And I just got such an incredible education through the reporting with him and through going to the, uh, you know, through meeting people at the court-martial that I ended up feeling like I had a pretty good sense of how things worked, at least when Bergdahl got back, that, I don't know. I mean, it's easy to say, hey, you just parachuted in and, you know, and did this, but I reported on it every day of my life for you know three plus years, and then wrote about it. You know, the whole thing was a. This book took three years to do, so I would just say to Ron, if you're listening, Ron, I mean, I respect everything you've done there, and I just want to know specifics. There were mistakes that were made that we were called out, and um, I just want to know specifically about the Bergdahl story. What you think we got wrong in a narrative sense, in a big picture sense. And the things that you and I have, you know, have talked about here today. This book tells a story of the Army burying intelligence on where a captured soldier was taken and using that buried intelligence to, to, as a pretext to fight the war in a different way. Do you hate the troops, Michael? Don't lie. Do you hate the troops? <laughs> That's the story of this book. Do you hate America? That's the story of this book. And another, uh, I'm studiously ignoring your question. <laughs> and another story of this book is that everyone we met through the trial and through this process of getting the full story here, was we met so many incredible people. Guys and women of honor and integrity and patriotism who did things for their country that I will never match. But to meet so many incredible people who worked for institutions that were so dysfunctional was always a weird tension. Right, right. You know what I mean? You guys who are um, with conviction and passion fighting the war, but they're inside a dysfunctional system. And at the court-martial, that was really clear. You could feel it every day. Because you got these young, the these young patriotic soldiers who are out yeah. there 
for God and country, like for them, it's all very, like that shit is for real. And the, the reason why I think the prosecution's case in the court martial fell flat is because after 18 years, those narratives don't carry as much weight as the counter narratives of what are we doing? Right, right. What are we really doing? And are we doing it the right way? And what was this moment with Bergdahl? And was it this thing that you're presenting? And what they presented of as Bergdahl was the sole cause of everything that happened was just an awfully convenient... Right, right. <laughs> everything that went wrong in this war. An convenient explanation for months and years and now decades of failures. So, um, that's a bit of a tangent. But no, but it's true. Yeah. Uh, that they, yeah, they tried to blame the entire war on him in some ways. Yeah. And, and I don't know, I'm curious why Ron finds this, because I know Ron's career intersected with this at a certain point, but mm -hmm. I'm curious what he finds particularly interesting or particularly objectionable or particularly inaccurate about our reporting. All right, well, someday in the future, maybe we can host the Michael Ron uh, cage match <laughs> uh, here on the team house. He knows a lot more about the war than I do. Oh, I, know, I know a lot more about the Bergdahl story. Ron is a wealth of knowledge, and uh, we, sure. did, we did two episodes with him, and I think each one is like three hours, and then we probably did like <laughs> a, a bonus segments with him, and each one of those is probably like 45 minutes, and, and we've still like only scratched the surface of <laughs> all the wild stuff he's gotten involved in. And I've only listened to one of those, and by the way, I love listening to it. He has incredible stories. You should, the, the bonus segment we did last time, uh, he tells a story about flying into Korangal in the middle of this huge firefight. And it was just like, God damn, wild stuff. Yeah. Um, but anyway, someone's asking what we're drinking here. And uh, <laughs> we're drinking Lefroy. Lefroy. Yeah. Lefroy, if you'd like Tenure. to sponsor this show, <laughs> we're available. And uh, Michael brought us this bottle here as a gift. For next time. Buffalo Trace, K Kentucky Straight Bourbon. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Well, we will enjoy that. Um, I think that's about it. Unless you guys got some questions or you got anything else to add, Michael. I mean, I think we, we went through a lot of it. I mean, I guess if you guys have any other questions, get them in like real quick and I'll, and I'll try to shoot them out to Michael. Um, my only other question is, you know, What's next for you? What's the you have another book in mind? What are you working I mean, definitely, on? Definitely. Look, this was a three-year project, so I told myself uh, five years before I get into another <laughs> multi-year project. Uh, so I'm planning on just doing some magazine reporting. That's a little bit more short-term. You know, a project that only lasts three to six months sounds good now. Okay. After one of, of of three years, but I I, I enjoy reporting on the government. Um, I enjoy reporting on systems of bureaucracy and how they are um, exploited, leveraged, manipulated um, by various parties. You know, the, the last story I did before this started was about an oyster farm in Northern California uh, under the Obama administration and how the EPA and the environmental organizations played some really dirty pool and did some really sketchy things and we had a whistleblower, just like this book is full of whistleblowers. I had a whistleblower who talked about how his scientific reports were doctored by people in the Department of the Interior. So I love this stuff. I love knowing about how people out there think that they can like manipulate systems that only work if people are honest and have integrity. <laughs> right. Systems only work if people treat if if people treat them as they're designed to work, and that's what frequently you know falls apart. All right, one last question. Uh, did they locate the location where Birddahl had that long fall that he talks about in the interview where he falls into a dry creek bed? That's a great question. Not that I know of. Um, if it is, it's classified and it's in all of the... I mean, all of, uh, Birddahl was interviewed for over 80 hours, and that doesn't even count his 15-6 report. The over 80 hours was just his classified debriefings, and that's all still classified and will be for probably, I assume most of my life. Um, but I think in terms of locations, there is a map in the beginning of this book, you may have noticed. And this map is kind of near and dear to me because it was, you know, I lived in Idaho for 10 years and um, I worked in a local newspaper and this map was made by uh, my former boss who was the art oh, director cool. at the newspaper and magazine. And I, I worked with her 
and with another professional map maker. And we don't know where Bergdahl was when he fell, but we do know where Bergdahl was when um, the first Taliban radio call was made when he was captured. You remember this? So yes. He's, he's, he's put on the back of a motorcycle. They and he was intercepted. Away. He's intercepted, and all of the reports already had him going west. And this is what the podcast got. One of the, one of, look, the podcast did a lot of things great. I don't want to trash it unnecessarily, but the podcast also did a lot of things um, inaccurately. And the podcast said, oh, uh, they were taking him west. The Taliban reports all had him taking him west, and we have a Taliban source who said they were taking him west when it was obviously immediately they were getting towards the border as fast as possible. So we do have, and it didn't make it into the final thing, um, into the final map, the GPS actual spot oh, right. where Bergdahl was when that first radio called the Taliban saying, hey, we got a guy. Oh, interesting. And they were already headed south towards, you know, towards the border. They made a beeline for the border. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, that whole story about him escaping is like pretty horrifying in so many ways. Um, he survived. I mean, yeah. something Bob Bergdahl said to me about his own son is he just wouldn't die. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he showed an amazing amount of resiliency for being in, ca ca uh, in captivity. For I think long. it would have killed a lot of other people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, on that note, Michael, um, I think this is good. I'm going to ask you to stick around for the bonus segment, and I will, because I, I want the... Give I want. I got some dirty talk. I want to, I want to hear the dirty talk um, that you were you were talking about people lying within the system. Um, okay, guys. Thank so you. thank you very much. Thank you everyone for yeah. joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Thanks for coming on the show and talking about your book again. It's American Cipher. Out in paperback. Paperback is out now. Bookstores. This. Go this check week. it out. Thank you for joining us on the show tonight, live, our Corona party. <laughs> uh, hopefully this helped you take your mind off uh, all that craziness for, you know, in a, almost two hours. Yeah. Stay clean out there. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for taking my mind off of it. We'll have a lot more to talk about on that subject, I think, next week. I hope so. Um, and uh, next week, Tracy Walder will be on. She was a... Um, uh, expert in biological weapons that worked in the counterterrorism center for the CIA. She has a new book out. We'll have her on. We're going to discuss all of that. And uh, please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. We're also on SoundCloud and iTunes if you prefer the podcast version. And uh, there's a link to our Patreon page down in the description if you're interested in supporting the stream. And we have like hours and hours and hours of bonus segments we've done with our guests. You can hear the Ron Moeller stories. Um, you know, the first one is about Abu Sabea in the Philippines, and the second one is about the Coringal Valley oh, firefight. Yeah. So if you supported the stream, Michael, I will. you would have I will. full access to all of these things for as little as one dollar a month. Oh, it's a bargain. It, it, it really is. It, it's like, you know, it, it's, a, it's like manna. It's amazing. All right. Enough of that. Uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for joining us. Thank you again, Thanks, Michael. Yeah. Thank you. All right, see you next week, everybody. Oh, yeah.